My name is Patrick McGinnis, and I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic, and it's changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show about finding the power to choose what you actually want in business and life and the courage to miss out on everything else. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, also known as the creator of the term FOMO, and I'm coming at you from AW360 Studios in the global capital of FOMO, New York City. So did you download the Headspace app on New Year's Day, use it for roughly a week, and then never open it again? If you did, and I did that so I know what it feels like, then you're probably like most of us. You want to take action in order to find a way to slow things down and act with intention. Try to find a way to live a more balanced and thoughtful life. But instead, after a few days of firing up Headspace, you get distracted, busy, and you pull yourself away from all those good intentions. Uh, And when you look up again, it's December, Nothing has changed and you go ahead and renew your annual Headspace membership in hopes that you'll actually change things in the new year. Sounds depressing, but I am happy to say that if you are looking for a way to actually make a change, find some focus, then I have the perfect guest for you. He spent a lot of time thinking about how you can design the life that you actually want and how you can escape from the traps that keep you from that life. Kehi is the author of Rad Reads, a guide for professionals on how to live an examined life. He is also a contributing editor at Quartz at Work, an edition of the site that is focused on being a better manager, building your career, and navigating the modern workplace. Kay spent the first 15 years of his career in the financial services industry researching hedge fund investments. From 2007 to 2015, he was a managing director at BlackRock, which I believe is the largest asset manager in the world, where he oversaw the New York research team. Kay graduated from Yale with a BS in computer science. Wow. Um, and he's here in the studio with me. So welcome, Kay. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, that's quite an illustrious intro. And, and I know. <laughs> we're I'm gonna, humbled. Well, it's, I'm just reading your bio. <laughs> but, um, but we're going to get in, into this more in more detail and, and how you ended up sitting in this chair today. But I want to start with a question of utter uh, uttermost importance to me, which is what is giving you FOMO right now? Oh, man. Uh, what's giving me FOMO is the millions of things that I need to be doing as an entrepreneur. And so as a solo entrepreneur, uh, you know, you glamorize the freedom, you glamorize the control, you glamorize the fact that I can pick up and move to LA in three weeks, which I'm doing. But behind the scenes, like, there are so many things that I need to be doing. They are um, creating the pool of ideas that I'm going to write from. They are paying my taxes. They are fixing that little glitch in WordPress that makes all of my content look really weird. And some other things, like what is the long-term strategy of my business? And so there's a fixed number of hours in a day. There's a a task list of 100 things, some super minute and some like 10,000 foot. And the reality is I'm only able to do two to three of those per day. And so the 97 other ones give me FOMO. Wow. I mean, I feel like you just described <laughs> my life in a way that makes it even sound more stressful. <laughs> but we had a funny situation today. So uh, for the benefit of the audience, you were, yeah. you, it's now, I guess, we're taping it about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You were going to be here at 10 o'clock, and then I, I overslept. So I actually <laughs> just everybody had a rough morning. Yes. But when I woke up, I had all these messages from you that you, be, you were up all night with um, a sick child and with a lack of air conditioning, which I can tell you, this is summertime in New York yes. City. It's rough. And I, it occurred to me as I read all your texts, and you were very, you're very good about keeping me posted on where you were. And I got like one, one email at a certain time of night saying, like, I'm hoping to get some sleep. Another saying, listen, I'm actually really tired. I don't think I can come in today. And I thought, like, part of he's feeling 
bad because he's mm. uncomfortable. But then there's some FOMO in there probably too, yeah. right? Because you're leaving in three weeks. I didn't even know that. Yeah. And you know, we've been wanting to do this for a long time. So, mm-hmm. so it's funny how when you also, when you work for yourself, it's like one thing if you work for a company, you miss a day of work and you like sort of don't get things done. Mm-hmm. It's another thing when you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to do things that push your business forward. And because of different unpredictable reasons, you can't do them. Yep. Yeah. And and I would say what the thought, the specific thought that's going through my mind as I'm sending you these emails at three in the morning is, holy crap, this is a wonderful opportunity to be on an amazing show with my friend to promote, you know, and, and talk about the things that I'm passionate about. And I might miss it. I might screw it up and it might be gone forever. So yeah, add FOMO to the list at three in the morning. Well, I when I read your email, I think my first reaction, I saw multiple emails and messages, which I, I first of all, I appreciated that. But then I was sort of like, oh man, this is like a little annoying because like I've got a whole day planned out. Mm-hmm. But then having been in the same spot as you, I thought to myself, all I had was compassion thinking, mm-hmm. okay, number one, I get that. I get yeah. what that is. And number two, well, let's find another, like, why don't we be flexible? And totally. Here, here we are today. Here we are. All right. So, so I, um, we're going to talk about what you do more a okay. little later, um, but I want to start with something. So I read your stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I get your your newsletter. I'm you know I, I really I think you're different. You, you, the kind of stuff you talk about is really is different than Thank a you. lot of people. Um, and one of the things you talk about, kind of, we, I said this in the bio, is about living an examined life, which mm-hmm. I could potentially take a stab at defining. Uh-huh. But considering that you were the expert, what does that mean? Yeah. So I guess. The way I think about it is that, you know, I'm 30, I just turned 39. And for the first, um, I worked on Wall Street until I was 35. And since I was like 12 or 13 years old, I had a singular focus on being successful, being on Wall Street, and making money. And I executed on that plan kind of relentlessly for 20 years. But I never asked myself, why do you actually want to be successful? Mm. What does success mean to you? And what are you running from something? Like what are the parts of yourself that you're uncomfortable with? I use the phrase a lot, uncomfortable introspection. Um, that you don't like about yourself, that you haven't, re- that are incongruous. What are those things? And I think for men on Wall Street in particular, you're just told like, Put it in a box, bury it deep, deep, deep in your soul, cover that box and hope that it never reaches. And work harder. Yeah. It's like, yeah, don't focus on that, just keep working. Exactly. And so that is an unexamined life. And uh, Socrates had said, an, un- an unexamined life is not worth living. And that's actually where I got that, um, that tagline for, for Rad Reads. And so I, it took me a while, but you know, 35 years later, I said to myself, you know what, all this time, I've let other people define success for me. Not only that, but I haven't defined it for myself. And then when I, so I see, like, take the time to say, what does success mean to me? Take a time to say, what is wealth? Take the time to say, like, how do I actually want to show up as a father and a husband? These are, they sound like very mundane questions, but I challenge you and your listeners, like, how many, time, how, how many people have carved out an hour, two hours per week to answer these questions? And the thing is, and this comes back to FOMO, we're so good. We are so good at podcasts and social media and reading books and speed reading and all that stuff. Like that is like our, our machinery, you know, like we are like tip top shape when it comes to that. Inside though, we're like emotional couch potatoes. We don't know what to do. We just sit on the couch all day and eat Doritos. And that imbalance, I think, is a, like a huge source of, of human suffering. That, and I try to tap into that for myself and then share it with others. That, that is, um, there's a lot in there, right? And I, first of all, I really, one thing I always like about what you do is that you're a very honest person. And so as I'm thinking, I think when you're honest, it allows me to start trying to be honest with myself. You know what I was like, thinking to myself, like, I kind of am a couch potato in these sort of ways, or here are the things that I've changed, or here's what I learned. Because many people, and I think both of you and I are examples of this, are people who came up through a system where, um, I, I, I don't, I, you know, you're, I believe your parents moved to the U.S. from other places. Is that yeah, right? uh, child of immigrants, yeah, right. uh, Cambodia. 
amazing. Yeah. And, and you came into the U.S. And you, if I had imagined, your parents were very much focused on you studying hard, working hard. Totally. Um, my, my grandparents were immigrants. My parents really mm. taught us the importance of education. And I was very good at that. And I won. And you won, you know, you, you went to Yale, which yeah. tells me that you're probably a pretty <laughs> good student. And then you got a very coveted job on Wall Street. I, I had the same sorts of things. And then one day you sort of walk into a wall and you realize, like, I have done all the things I said I was going to do. And yet there's no perfection in what I've done. You know, I have all mm-hmm. these things. I have all this money. And I'm finding happiness by spending it on stuff I don't mm-hmm. really need. And so you, you sort of start to realize these things. And for me, that realization came because I was working at AIG during the yeah. 2008 financial crisis. And my job basically became like, kind of went away. And so I had to sort of come to a point of reckoning. Now you mm-hmm. um, decided to leave. You started a company, you, you, you're doing all kinds of different things. Like what drove you to make this change and what are you doing now? What did this turn into for you? Yeah. So what, what drove me was, um, you know, I had this great job on Wall Street. Um, I got the promotions, I got the bonuses. And every time something good would happen, I get a surge of happiness. I'd be like, yeah, I got this. All this hard work's paying off. And then 10 days later, mean reversion. So like right back to where I was before, like slightly better. I don't want to take away. Like getting promoted, making money are amazing things. And I feel fortunate to have those. But it's kind of like ice cream, right? Like the first scoop of ice cream, delicious. The second, a spoonful, pretty damn good. When you're at the end of the Ben and Jerry's, your mind is eating and you're not even hungry. And, and guess what? You feel like crap the next day. And I felt like I was just going through the motions. And how did that manifest? Really, really bored. I was just looking around, like, you know, there's like two hour Monday staff meetings. Like, am I gonna do this for the next 30 years of my life? And it was scary because I was like, A, I could, and B, my life would be damn comfortable. And the FOMO, right, it's like, whoa, like people really wanted that seat. So that was one thing. The other thing was that I was an expert, but an expert in the tiniest sliver. I analyzed computer trading hedge funds. There were probably like 100 of us that do that in the world. Great. I was good at it. But... I don't know, like we're recording in a podcast uh, video in the middle of Midtown in August. Like there's just, I knew that there was this expansive world out there. And to talk to another like computer, like, hey, what's your algo about trading (laughs) stocks? I was just like, I'm good at it. But there's more to life than that. And then the third thing is like entrepreneurship, you would know this, is there's just this pull that you can't really describe it. And you could feel like, you know, I always ask people, What are the activities that you do where time just melts away? And for me, they were these little projects that I would do on the weekends, on the mornings. And the number of those things kept increasing. And I was like, I owe it to myself to explore what those things are. I love I I, I love the image of of the fact that there's so much happening outside of you know, your office and you're sitting there, you know, people want the seat, you know, you're in this coveted place. You're making a lot of money. Yeah. Um, you know, people don't go work at Blackstone uh, or, or BlackRock or yeah. any of these asset management firms because, you know, it's fun. It's, yeah. it's, it's interesting work, but it's well, well compensated. But I, I always had this experience is when I'd be working um, in, on Wall Street and I would maybe in the middle of the day, I had to run an errand. Mm-hmm. And I got in the subway and I went downtown and I would get out at Union Square, which is a, you know, a major thoroughfare in New York City. And it was packed. Yeah. with people and I was like who are all these people yeah. and this was before everybody was working out of coffee shops this was you know a yeah. even you know before that dating yourself here now you I know right <laughs> uh, when you walk out of a corporate office in Midtown Manhattan and you go to the Starbucks down the street there's like the whole place is full of people who work for themselves and, yeah. and there is this world that has that has taken over and so it is I think that pull is very strong mm-hmm. but yet many people are trapped now, yeah so what you you ran away but you 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 know from that world and you've created something entirely new yeah. so what is rad reads what's what's Kay's world look like today yeah um, and so there was an intermediate step and I think it ties a lot to FOMO that I could that I could cover with you sure. was when I left I thought what I need is a bigger challenge I need something harder. I need something more high profile. I need to be in the uh, Fortune 40 under 40. 
And so I actually thought that I needed to start a venture back company, like follow the playbook. Again, I was reacting to what I thought people wanted from me, kind of running into running towards the FOMO. And so I had a, this kind of awakening when I kind of went down this path of fundraising. I'm like, this is not what I want to do. This is not me. And I had, had got a taste of freedom and of a different life. Yes. And so... And when you, when you raise venture capital, you basically just get a new boss. Exactly. Um, so you, the, that is another myth that suddenly, you know, you've got to... Be, these, these, having a bunch of investors who are, by the way, not the easiest people to deal with that are suddenly telling you what to do yeah. is basically, you know, listen, there, it, it opens a lot of doors, but it doesn't solve the problem. Yeah, totally. And so I then began writing. Just kind of saying on my blog, Rad Reads, um, saying, hey, it may look like I got everything together. Like, this is the, the job, the seat, the compensation. But I'm really confused. I'm not particularly happy. I'm not the husband and friend that I want to be. I'm really envious of others. I'm really judgmental. I have a pretty damn big ego. And I was like, this stuff's kind of messed up. And I don't know why it's the case but let me take you through my journey to try to unpack that. And so it really started uh, as a blog and evolved into like what I call the the guide to living an examined life. But really what I am is just a cheerleader to others. And I just want to go to people like you and like the thousands of readers and listeners, and I'll, I'll, I'll lay out the properties and just say like, like you're not alone in what you're feeling. You got this. You're enough. You're going to be okay and see what that means, see how that translates into their personal lives, their work lives, how they take risk, how they love, how they talk to themselves in their own head. And so how does that manifest? Um, I write a lot. I write on my blog. I write an email newsletter, which is actually one of the ways we got connected. Um, I host, uh, I've hosted multiple podcasts in the past. My own called Rad Awakenings. We're launching one with Quartz at work called um, Forward Thinking about recreating your career. So oh, I love very that. Very similar to, to these stories. They posted. Um, and then I just do a lot of this stuff on social media. You know, I just share in, through different types of stories, which leads to public speaking, which leads to a little bit of consulting. And so really, I just cobbled a lot of random things together. Um, they, you know, they allow me to live the life that I want to live. It's not easy. Um, but most importantly, Every day I get to create, every day I get to interact with uh, members of, of my community, and every day I get to share my journey, which in my own way is very therapeutic. So there's like a selfishness to it too. But it, it, it is it is very honest. Everything you say is honest, but it's also, I find I get ideas. So I get the Rad Reads newsletter and I'll go through it. And it's sort of like you write things of your own and you're curating, I hate that word, I, <laughs> let me just unsay that. Um, you are selecting... <laughs> You're selecting really good content that's, I think it's very practical stuff that I, we are all buried in content, so mm-hmm. I, I really enjoy it. Um, I always wonder, and I see this for myself, so I left the corporate world, and I get two reactions from people. Oh, I got three. The first mm-hmm. reaction I get from people is like, wow, your life's amazing. Like, mm-hmm. you have no masters. Like, you do your own thing. And, you know, and that's the fallacy of that, of course, is that I still need to make a living to mm-hmm. live in a place like New York City. The second is, what do you do? People don't understand. It's like, okay, like you cannot be put into a box. And so there are a lot of people that just sort of say, like, I, I don't understand what you do. Yep. And the third thing that happens is, um, you will meet somebody and you'll have nothing to talk about because it's like unless your whole relationship was formed around work yeah. and these folks, maybe they support you and maybe they're your friends still, but it's like if you can't talk about like hedge fund economics mm-hmm. at, 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 and by, they're probably pretty, you're probably not as excited about yeah. them anymore, right? You really have little to connect on. So like as you've embarked on this journey, mm-hmm. like how has your sort of like connection with the people around you changed? Oh man! Uh, so when I uh, when I quit, I got um, sent into like an emotional tailspin. When I would get this text message, I probably got like forty times in the three months after I quit, and it was in all caps. What are you doing now? Question mark. Question mark. Oh question yes, mark. that's terrible. It is like a dagger through the heart, yes. especially because I didn't know what I was doing. Yes, and people who haven't been entrepreneurs see two states of the world. You're working. Or you're on vacation. Entrepreneurs know that there's a messy, messy middle where you're like, 
I mean, I hate to bring in like Ernest Hemingway, but you're like sitting in a cafe drinking wine in the middle of the afternoon and you're like, that's the thing. And is that work? Yes. Is that play? Like there's wine involved, so most people would default to it's play. I don't know. You can't define it. But to get that text, oh, I mean, it almost drove me back into getting a job. So that was like the first phase. Um, And then the second phase, I can totally empathize with you, is then describing what to, what you do. I mean, think about how I just described to your listeners. It took me like 30 seconds. Yes. You know, most people are like, give me something that I know. Give me a label so that I can like rank you and all that and understand you really quickly uh, because I don't want to go to the effort, through the effort to like piece together all the various consistent parts. But here's the thing, and this is where the examine life part comes in, the un- uncomfortable introspection. Are, are your insecurities just projecting that on the person who asks you that? Or is that person actually malevolent and being passive aggressive when they ask you that? We'll never know. Yes. But the only thing you can control is how you react. And so in learning how to control, and I use all these different strategies. At first, I'd be like, I'm fun employed. So like, I use like a, <laughs> I a laughing too. strategy. I totally did that. Wow. And, and then I use like the portfolio. I was like, da, 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 da. But here's, like, here's where the insecurity comes in. I would always say, like, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. I don't really know what I'm doing, like, like throwing a little self-deprecation. And then I'd, then I'd say, but I'm working the hardest I've ever worked. Because that was me playing to the labels of the person and being like, my identity, don't you think of me as a slacker? Because I'm not. That's my identity. And being a slacker in this society is like, you're a pariah. Yes. Um, And this whole journey, this examined life is just really letting go of that. Like, I tell people when I see them, like, I'm trying actively to work less. And it's really hard, but my goal is to work less. And I'm telling you, like, we talked to a friend outside. I'm not trying to build a massive company. Yeah. Not now. Maybe later. Yes. I get it. This is my, when I quit my job, my brother, who's a jazz musician, sat me down and he said, you should take the first six months. Because I plan to take off at least six months. Mm-hmm. And I had saved for that and it was, you know, it was in yeah. the budget. But um, he said, you should get up every day for six months not knowing what you're going to do that day. Mm-hmm. And I remember we were sitting at La Bonbonniere in uh, the West Village of Manhattan, and I looked at him like he was crazy. Mm-hmm. And then I did it. Yeah. And I, it was almost like deprogramming myself from yeah. all these things about status. And what, you know, I used to, I used to have, you know, when I would see friends who left work at six or seven at night, and I was there till 10, I thought that they were weak or failures or that they weren't the good enough or not smart enough. Yeah, I, I was super judgmental yeah, about too. that. And because my value system and what I was appraised on and what would make me successful was not that. And Mm -hmm. so it just didn't fit into my worldview of what is success, right? And as I went through that deprogramming, I realized, number one, is yes, it's really hard to describe when you're not doing something conventional. And it definitely hits your your, um, sense of self. But number two is once you stop caring as long as it listens and a part of it's you're just lost right you're yeah. trying to figure it out and it takes time mm-hmm. but i found that once i got beyond that and and i started creating ideas and talking about things that mattered and doing the kinds of things that you're talking mm-hmm. about um you then have a lot less time to sit mm-hmm. around worrying about um what other people are thinking because you're putting stuff out in the world and Mm -hmm. when you're doing that you're starting to convince other people to share your ideas to build a community and those things um are things that you could unfortunately never do when you're working if i I mean if you googled me when i was working (laughs) full-time there'd be nobody except for patrick mcginnis the ceo of ralston purina yeah was the you know the patrick mcginnis (laughs) doing stuff and now, years later, I mean, Patrick McGinnis from Austin is retired. So, like, I'm owning the Patrick yeah. McGinnis out there. Now, you're lucky. Your name is, yeah. is like, you're a one of a kinder. Totally. So. Totally. But, do you, you know, there, in that, what I hear is, is trust. Like, like, there's a trust and, and, like, confidence. Not in, like, the quiet confidence, but there's, there's trust in the broader system and, like, how it all works together. And let's go back to the story of this morning where, you know, I'm like, oh, crap, I'm going to bail on this podcast. It's really early in the morning. This is this. Um, But then I was like, I just trust Patrick. And what's meant to happen will happen. And I can only control what I can what I can control, which is like, I feel really crappy right now. And you probably don't want to interview me on zero hours of sleep. And look what happened. 
tw- six hours later, we're having a great interview. Totally. And so it's like, how do you get to that point of trust? You know, and people will say trust in the universe. That's like a little wooey, but I, I do believe it. You know, if you're able to kind of put yourself out there in a way that is like open and authentic and, and a little vulnerable, like the, the, the pieces will work. Um, and how do you develop the practices to get yourself in that, to like be able to put yourself in that state of mind when like you are on zero hours of sleep or when like things are not going your way is something that I would love to help people with. I love that. And I think, you know, as we think about this, putting yourself out there and being genuine and about the people that you used to work with, some of those people that you used to work with will still be your friends and they will mm-hmm. stand by you and they will get you and you will have great conversations. Other people were people that were, of a point in time in your life that, you know, no ill will, but like they just, you're not, you're not communicating. You're Mm -hmm. not in the same place. You're not, you're not giving anything that they really respond to. They're not giving you what you need to respond Mm -hmm. to. And so you can sort of just decide, listen, you know, how many people can I really be in touch with? Yeah. Um, You know, I'd rather be in touch with people who are, you know, kind of on my wavelength. Uh, When we talk about lifestyle change, you 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 um, have written a lot about um, sort of lifestyle creep, yeah, which is a topic that is is near and dear to my heart because (laughs) I (laughs) when I was, you know, I I I like to live a good life. I like to spend money on things, and I'm I probably more experiences that now than than you know things. But I remember when I quit my job, I bought this um, Henry Miller Eames chair, and you know, which is which is an awesome chair, but yeah. it's a real investment of money. And I also realized that as, as I was moving away from that lifestyle, I started spending less money, not because I didn't, not because I decided to, but because I just didn't, I didn't have that impulse in the same way. Mm-hmm. But you've written about the fact that, you know, you were doing like, you were Maria condoing yourself yeah. and getting rid of stuff you don't need. Totally. And you had the $2,000 bike and the, you know, probably all kinds of other tools. How do you manage that when you still, you know, you, we live in, a, you know, a, a, a modern age where there's lots of temptations. Mm-hmm. You've got, you live in New York City. Um, you have a lot of friends who probably are buying lots of stuff that, you know, we, yeah. we'd all love to have. How do you manage the, that whole transition? Yeah, I think so. I'd say there's like a continuum. There's just like little hacks. And then there's kind of the 10,000 foot view of like what's really happening. And so I think the 10,000 foot view is more important. And so I'll start with that. You know, a lot of the, it's like the ice cream example. Like how do you get to the razor's edge without going over? And I mean, it's almost like a metaphor of life, right? It's like, what is the perfect amount of ice cream to, to not leave you yearning for more, but not making you feel like crap? And then like life is that. What's the perfect amount of sleep? What's the perfect amount of work? What's the perfect uh, amount of fun? What's the perfect amount of sleep? Um, and so I think that for me, to go back to your question, spending, there was always this like, it's like spending was this silver bullet to make some problem go away. So I, I remember it's like, you know, I'm having this problem as an entrepreneur. All I need is a new iPad. And once I get it, because like there's this one thing that I need to do on an iPad that doesn't work super well on my laptop. Once I spend that like $999, $999 with like the $200 pencil, boom, entrepreneurship will pencil. be fixed. <laughs> you know, and, and you get that. And that's a lot of money for an entrepreneur. And no one needs another iPad, like really. Um, and then two, it's like the bonus thing. It's like two days later, you say to yourself, nothing's changed. And so you start to notice these patterns. So you notice these patterns of like escapism, but then you also notice patterns internally. Like I know the things that really, really make me happy. I love being like outdoors running, being fit. So like I will pay money for like exercise related things. Um, I like reading a lot. I like magazines. Like I, so I'll pay money for books and magazines and things like that. And I love travel. So when we travel, but I don't really like, and I like Nikes. Like I don't know if the camera shows, but I have like 20 pairs of Nike Air Maxes. Um, nice. But I don't like watches. I don't like um, briefcases. I don't like suits. I don't, you know, I, there's most electronics outside of Apple products. I don't like, and so you get, you develop this awareness that you, you know what makes you happy. You double down on those things and you're able to carve out um, the other things. And so then on the pragmatic side, I think, I think it was Peter Drucker, the management guru that said, what gets measured gets mastered. 
And so, you know the number, I do some coaching as part of my work, the number of, of uh, wealthy people who have no idea how much money they spend each year is like 90 plus percent in That's my insane. like empirical, uh, you know, small sample set. And like they don't know if they spend like 5,000 a month or $17,000 a month. Like they actually don't know. And I was one of those. I mean, my range was not like that. Um, and so just something as basic. Like when I go through my, I don't budget. I'm, I'm 39. I'm too old to budget. I don't do it either. And my income's too. way too variable. Um, but I go through my statements each month. I set a threshold and I say, I'm going to just put a little X. I'm printing out the statement on anything that's over, say, like $400. And then I was like, okay, what was that thing? What was that thing? And then you're like, wow, I, that dinner actually wasn't that good. That, was, that dinner was crossed to the razor's edge. And then you just know with no judgment, but you just note. And you're like, were we frustrated that day? And we just were like, let's go eat dinner, you know, kind of like, like impulse buying or yeah. um, uh, retail therapy. And then you just you develop that self-awareness. And, and, and the thing I'd add is my wife and I have really synced up our language in this. Um, and so we're able to kind of have these conversations jointly around things like spending and, and around things like feelings and insecurities. That, we could talk about that. That's separately. super smart. Uh, the, the, cause I think that challenge of when you do change your life, it's always easier to move up and spend mm-hmm. more money. Right. And, and, but cutting it back. And I, I've had friends who had, you know, friends who were affected by the Madoff scandal yeah. or, in 2008 who lost their jobs and had to really restructure their lives. And mm-hmm. I think it, it, it's a very difficult transition to make, and once you you get you get beyond that, you you realize a lot of those things weren't necessary. Mm-hmm. But the emotional, the um, the feeling of you know uh, a status that it's people status. have, um, those things can be extremely difficult to deal with, especially when you are um, when you are somebody who's used to having certain kind of things that you can do. Totally. You know, I'm, you know I, that you presenting to the world how you you were somebody who worked on wall street you saved money so you're you you had a, a sort of the ability to um plan for this and mm-hmm. to make some adjustments over a period of time and so your your adjustment while you know meaningful is 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 one that you were able to sort of cushion how how about for somebody who's listening who maybe um has not got a, a you know a lot of money in the bank or something yeah. at this point in their life how can they Make smart decisions about money and about you know these sorts of elements, so they can they can have the type of, sort of mm-hmm. the type of experience you're talking about. Yeah, it's a great question, and and I think the first thing I would say on that is like I, absolutely, I had saved a lot of money, and that enabled me to do what I did. Yeah. The thing that people ask me that question a lot. The thing that I also say is, I was 35. The stakes are higher when you, you like the opportunity cost was much greater. So that's just a mental consideration of of having, you know, earned more money. And then the other thing is my expenses were way higher, not because of like what I like to buy, but I was supporting like three dependents. Um, And I tell people, you know, if you go on Obamacare as a single 22 year old guy with a high deductible plan, you could probably get like a $200 uh, premium. Like my family's COBRA was multiple, multiple, multiple times of that. So, you know, it's a little bit like having a kid. There's never really a right time and there's always something a little bit illogical about it. Um, But, uh, shoot, I lost my train of thought. Can you repeat the actual question? Really what I'm driving at is, you know, if you want to choose an exam in life, you know, you are not necessarily able to budget for it, but yeah. you want to do this. And this, this is a show all about choosing the life you want. Yeah. Like now knowing everything, you know, having gone through this whole journey, like what, what would you tell people to do? Yeah. So I, I would, I, I call it, um, I'm going to get a little geeky on, um, Bring it on. on like wall street. I call it like stock tip, find the stock tips for the soul. And what I mean by that is, you know, a friend interviewed me the other day, uh, for uh, an, an investor meeting, and she was just an analyst. She was an analyst, so that's not her job to interview people. And she was so nervous about it, and she overprepared, and she practiced in front of her husband. And after she told me, she's like, "I haven't felt so alive in doing that since I in doing that." And she's like, "You know, I just I'm in Excel all day." And I said, "You know, you're so lucky that you saw that little glimmer." Like, that doesn't mean you have to be a public speaker. That doesn't mean you have to be a stand-up comedian. But people spend their whole lives looking for those little strands, those stock tips for the soul. And so then I told her, I was like, well, what are you going to do with that? It doesn't mean quit your job. She actually likes her job. 
But how are you going to commit 30 minutes, one hour, two hours a week to just pulling at that strand and seeing where it takes you? And, and, and I want to be emphatic that that doesn't mean you should quit your job. You might just find that like, hey, the hobby that, I, that has been missing in my life is stand-up comedy. Or I actually should start a podcast. And so pull on these things. And it requires intentionality. You need to look. You need to see them. And if you're always like, that guy has the watch and this person has the apartment and this person stays at the Four Seasons, you're just going to like steamroll through these little moments. Like when your jazz musician brother was just like, look around, like take it in. And then when you take it in, like apply that discipline that you would as an analyst, like create a process around it and see where that takes you. And I think because people are always searching for passion and meaning and they think it's like, like going to Africa and like building a school and quitting their job and like blowing through their savings, like that's one version. There's hundreds of thousands of versions. And to the thing that we were talking about, like creating your own story, like not being able to describe what you do in one word, that analyst has an opportunity to add something else into her story. And then that will lead to something else. And that will lead to something else. And if you're able to do the work on yourself and not be bogged down by the status questions, not be bogged down by the lifestyle creep, not like be intentional, then you give more space for those things to thrive. And I don't know where it will go. Yes. That's, but it will go. That is, that is so true. You don't know. You may fail, by the way, but by by sort of maintaining some level of stability, I mean, this is back to sort of 10% entrepreneur ideas, you, know, you maintain the state of release and try things on the side. Mm-hmm. You avoid, and if you do this earlier rather than later, you are gonna be in a better position to do this. Because I've seen, I, I met this guy recently, uh, when uh, a friend of a friend who was working in a job he absolutely hated. And he felt like his life was going by him. And he quit He quit his job. He took his savings and went on. He spent a week. I don't, I don't know how much he had in the bank, but he basically spent a week at an extraordinarily expensive hotel. And at the end of the week, he was out of money. And so... <laughs> I know. It's it it like was, either the hotel or the job, the savings. Yeah, I'm like, not entirely sure. I need, I need to work yeah. through that. I mean, I, I know he had bought real estate, so he had some assets. But yeah. anyway, he basically spent his entire um, sort of savings, his rainy day savings on mm-hmm. this weird sort of, not, I don't want to say weird, it sounds judgmental, but this kind of like this, I think, pretty questionable decision yeah. for one week. And then he ended up kind of driving up to um, the state of Maine and just sort of became it's really interesting you just met some people and now he's living there and working up there and i think it'll turn out fine yeah but my thought was like if you had sort of tested some of these things before mm. instead of almost like forcing yourself into yeah. this position by quitting your job and spending all your money you're forcing yourself to change mm-hmm. i i know somebody else who just gave up their apartment in new york city they live here as a way of forcing themselves to quit their job it's sort yeah. of like they don't they don't want to they, they can't get the power to do it so they're kind of creating all these very uncomfortable yeah. conditions to do it. And, the, the, and I get it. And, and I, 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 you know, I think I'm very sympathetic towards that. But if you can do what Kay is saying and actually start something now, yeah. you take some of the pressure off that you won't end up in that sort of position. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and really, like, entrepreneurship is not for everyone. No. Uh, it's really intense. There was this Marie Andrew quote uh, on Instagram. She's an Instagram illustrator. And it, was, and it said, do what you love. Uh, and then it, it was like crossed out in gigantic X's and, and it said work all the time. Um, and I think that that gets a little bit lost in the story. But I think the broader thing that we're both saying is that there's no silver bullet to figuring these things out. That, you know, thousand dollar hotel that your friend went to, like maybe he thought it was the silver bullet. For me, it's like I thought when I quit that being like a vent- the founder of a venture back company was the silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. You can't buy something that will make, take you from being unhappy to happy. There's no silver bullet purchase. And I think like really remembering that and then thinking about the component pieces and how they interact together and giving them the space while also shutting down or, or taming the more reptilian instincts that we have to self-loathe, self-sabotage, to judge, you know, you can kind of like get there from, from both angles by like taming the desires and also taming the internal reaction. And then you find this state, like I, I, I call it like um, equanimity. There's just this calmness yes. and this lightness. And it doesn't mean you're soft. 
doesn't mean you lost your edge. So it was almost like a samurai. It's like you just you just know, and then you're ready. Like, whoosh, like <laughs> um, but but you just you're just calm. You know. On that note, before we we ended up uh, getting out of the swords and uh, and starting, yeah. playing, um, I want to ask you, Kay, where can people find your work? That's thank you so much, and thank you for this opportunity. It's been amazing um, to be friends, co co collaborators, co creators, um, and I'm really honored to do this. Uh, I'd say the main destination is the blog, Rad Reads, R A D R E A D S dot C O. And the reason why it's rad is because when I started a company, I, I, it was my homage to skate and surf culture. Mm-hmm. So I wanted like to bring the word back into the like common lexicon. Um, Instagram Rad Reads Co. There's the Rad Awakenings podcast, and we are launching um, forward thinking on Quartz Set work uh, shortly. Amazing. Well. Uh, you just heard where to go. I, I, I certainly enjoy all the work that Kay's doing, and I've, um, that's why I wanted to have him on the show. Uh, if you want to f- find out more about me, about Temperson Entrepreneurship, so you don't have to quit your job to um, live your startup dream, you can go to patrickmcginnis.com. Um, there you will find connections to everything I'm working on, um, including other uh, episodes of FOMO Sapiens. And if you go to iTunes, you can actually subscribe to FOMO Sapiens. And while you're there, please consider giving uh, us a five-star review and a um, and all kinds of other, I guess, reviews that you can do on there. Um, with that, um, I want to wish you um, the very FOMO-free week. And until next time, I'm coming at you from AW360 uh, Studios in New York City. I'm Patrick McGinnis. Take care of yourself. <laughs>